Good afternoon, everyone, and great to see you all again, especially with a couple of states now right in the throes of reopening or having reopened, or certainly with an imminent reopening on the horizon. Our last couple of webinars has obviously been focused on the essential topics of personal venue and equipment cleaning and hygiene. And I hope you found that cleaning and hygiene uh, fact sheet that we put out last week of, of some use to you. The feedback has been fantastic overall, uh, along with a large number of views of these webinars. So I'm really glad that it seems these webinars and the topics that we're presenting um, are really seem to be hitting the mark for you. And I'm certainly sure that today's webinar will as well, as we talk about the latest return to sport document, hot off the press. It was only released by the Federal Minister Richard Colbeck on the weekend. And I'm very excited to have with us today, um, Rob Dalton, the acting CEO of Sport Australia, who put this tool kit together. And I'll introduce Rob properly and speak to him in, um, in a minute. As we know, the national principles and the AIS framework for rebooting sport released a few weeks ago, provided, they both provided a broad context and structure for returning to sport in a COVID-19 environment. This new return to sport toolkit that has been released this week is based on and builds on those national principles and the AIS guidelines, but they take it a step further. And this return to sport toolkit includes a practical and simple set of resources and checklists for a club of any size, small, medium, large, profit, not for profit, any type of club to use to ensure that they've covered off all the, all the basics from a national perspective. And as always, I will sound like a broken record here again, um, but to reiterate that these documents are national guidelines. And in the first instance, you need to be following any specific state and territory regulations or requirements that are relevant in your particular geographical jurisdiction. And my other mantra for reopen and reopening, as you know well by now, is to be cautious and methodical in your approach to reopening. Now, after I've, I've chatted with Rob, a couple of other guests online today, um, we have Stephen Campbell, the Acting Senior Manager Development at Gymnastics Queensland. Stephen's been doing some great work supporting his clubs in Queensland. So I look forward to speaking to him to discuss how Queensland clubs are preparing for their reopening and some of the important considerations that they're currently looking at. Also look forward to chatting to Megan Moss, the owner and director of Gungarland Gymnastics Club from the ACT. Megan um, will outline some of the things that her club is doing, which I imagine took on a whole new perspective late yesterday afternoon when the ACT government basically announced with 72 hours notice that clubs will be up and running from this weekend. But first, to our special guest, we have online with us, as I said, Rob Dalton, um, acting CEO at Sport Australia, probably one of the busiest people working in sport at the moment. So I really appreciate, Rob, you finding the time to come to speak to us today. I've been chatting with Rob quite a lot lately <laughs> during this period over the last couple of weeks as we navigate our way through this landscape. And what's been great from my point of view is the fantastic collaboration that we've had amongst NSOs and alongside closely partnered with Sport Australia as we do try and, and navigate. There's been a lot of national advocacy going on. A lot of that is behind the scenes. A lot of it is being led by Sport Australia but really involving NSOs. And it's been great to be a part of that. And all that national advocacy has one sole purpose, and that is to get our community sporting clubs back up and running safely as soon as we possibly can. And this return to sport toolkit certainly fits into that national advocacy piece. It's aimed at being a practical and useful toolkit to help clubs of all sizes reopen safely. It provides a clear roadmap and resources to navigate what can be a bit of a minefield of information out there for you. So I was asked by Sport Australia to, amongst other NSOs, to help review and contribute to this document, to the toolkit. And it was great to be involved with the development of such an important piece of work as we look to, to reopen our clubs. So Rob, welcome and thank you very much for, for joining us. Thanks, Kitty. Can you firstly maybe just outline some of the, I suppose, the key features of the Return to Sport Toolkit and how it does build on the national principles and, and the AIS framework? 
Yeah, thanks. And, uh, and hello to everybody. And uh, I do want to start out by just thanking every one of you for your contribution to sport in Australia and particularly to gymnastics. Without all of you, we, we don't have a sport and uh, we, we should never forget that. Volunteers are the lifeblood of our organisations and, and, and of our country. So, so thank you. Um, so the, the, this toolkit was developed. Um, it, it was really interesting because things move so quickly. Uh, we, we tried to create the framework and, and I was very keen to have a framework in place that was driven by the AIS, but also to have that follow on with, um, you know, the, the how. You know, we all knew about the what and we, we wanted to make sure of the how because, you know, we all know that this has never happened before. We've never had a pandemic that's actually shut the country down. And so certainly in sport, we've never had to do this before. Um, it was really interesting because the framework was actually created in three days, believe it or not, uh, the AOS framework. The, uh, the team there just worked around the clock. And then, of course, the government task force got, uh, got going and was able to approve it. And we just weren't able to. We, we really wanted one document so that everyone could. There it is. Um, but there were just, uh, we really wanted to collaborate. And I think that's, uh, you know, is a, is a great part of this is that we just didn't charge off and say, oh, we know better than everybody else. Uh, we use sports like, uh, you know, like hockey, like gymnastics, um, cycling and athletics itself as well. So, you know, we, we all got together, but we also spoke to our states uh, and our state uh, offices of sport and also community sports. So it was a really great collaboration as to why we wanted to do this. What was really important here, and we started with the principle that if we do not skill and tool up our volunteers, we, we can't turn the show on again. And that's just simply the case. And so it was a really important thing that we thought uh, to, to complement the, the framework that was done by the AIS, to have a really detailed how, and you know, the more we actually got into it, uh, you know, we've created two streams, uh, there are lots of tools, checklists, um, you know, just even, uh, you know, our registers to be able to fill in so we know who was at the venue and who wasn't. So it was really all encompassing. Um, we're, not, we're not planning and Kitty, you know, has spoke perfectly before about what to do and what not to do. But, but, you know, we're driven by our states. Every one of our states have got a different status. Northern Territory is operating. South Australia is dying to get into it. I think they've gone 19 days without an incident. Um, so, so different states are at different stages. So this document, this toolkit actually prov provides a base. If our states want to draw upon that information, they're well and truly able to do that. Uh, it's, a, it's a toolkit, it covers, you know, a link to the World Health Organization, uh, to states, to, to, to different announcements that have been made. So everything's there if someone wants to know about it. But again, it is all driven to make sure that our volunteers are provided with enough information to be able to run the show. Yeah, it certainly does, Robin. And you mentioned the uh, the checklists, and I think it's a very, as I mentioned, it can be a minefield of information out there, and and this really gives some very clear direction. One of the recommendations in there, um, or suggestions perhaps, is. For clubs to have a COVID-19 safety coordinator. Um, now, I don't think that's mandatory in, in all states. Some states it is. Can you outline a bit about that role and how that might be relevant to our clubs? Yeah, I think, um, I, I think it's a really important thing, you know, for us to have someone who's actually got that little bit more knowledge, who's actually read up on things, who can uh, coordinate the party, so to speak. Um, it's really important that you know, our volunteers are going to be running around. We all know, we can all visualise what is going to happen when we, uh, when we turn that key. And it is important that someone has that, that, that mantra of looking after safety. It is really, really important because if we see some incidents that, uh, that are going to lead to, to perhaps not adhering to some of the social distancing guidelines, we want to be able to shut that down pretty quickly. So the safety officer, making sure all of those checks are undertaken, making sure everybody's briefed, making sure all of the sanitization takes place is a really critical thing. It's a very important role. Yeah, no, I agree. Absolutely, Rob. And you've probably actually just answered this next question when you, when you spoke about education of, of staff members and members um, and the sanitization and the, and the, the safety role. 
if you had to pick out, I suppose, the top three things that the clubs on this webinar should be thinking of to get it right before before reopening, what, what would they be? Yeah, I think um, I, I think the most important thing to start with is to make sure you've got your um, uh, you've got all your volunteer schedules organised. Uh, this is going to take a much bigger uh, volunteer uh, cohort than we've ever had before, and I think that that's really important. Um, you know, it isn't just your roster where someone turns the lights on. You know, particularly in the case of uh, of gymnastics, turns the lights on the venue and everybody goes. There, there's some really important things. So having your rosters right, uh, having your scheduling right, and uh, you know, the the safety officer will will need to be across all of that stuff. I think the entry and the exit process is absolutely critical. Um, I, I've sat and watched on many occasions. Um, you know, locally here we go and pick up. Uh, you know, some takeaway food to support the local, the local organisations. And, and everybody is sort of standing out the front, but we still end up with one person walking in and one person walking out, and they go within six centimetres of each other. <laughs> That's true. It's, you know, and every, everyone's doing all the right thing, but some of these organisations are just not, they're, they're just not geared for being able to do that. Yep. Uh, so I think that that's a really important thing, even even to the extent of having a, a, a lollipop person with a stop go sign. But I, but I think everyone the the entry and the exit is really important. Um, and I think that the third thing is really uh, is communication. This is something that you know we 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 won't think about it unless we're reminded to think about it because we're not programmed to be this cautious. And you see it in, out on the street every day you know, people walking around each other and it's all very odd and awkward. So, so the communication, you know, having a channel, whether it's a WhatsApp, uh, whatever the, 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 um, the, the modem, this, this modem is perfect, you know, just being able to use this and I congratulate you for doing it, uh, is just that communication of letting people know and reminding all of those aspects. Uh, and of course, the, 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 venue, the venue setup is so critical you know, particularly the indoor venues, you know, having people and watching and, you know, we caught lots of, uh, uh, lots of aggro over the weekend because a journalist assumed that when it said one parent, that that meant you couldn't bring your grandparents. But the <laughs> fact of the matter is, you know, we, we do not want our venues to be overburdened with people. So we've stipulated one person. So that means we know how many people are going to be at the venue as a maximum. If we end up with a thousand people in a venue, we can't possibly stick to the social distancing. So, yeah. so I think it's you know there's a lot of common sense, um, but but you know it's people taking responsibility for these things because, you know I think uh, I think probably one of your next questions there, Kitty is, um, you know I've said all weekend we only get one shot at this, yep. and if you think about how long it took, we 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 were shut down in March. It's taken this long for us to get to a point where we've got, you know, 10 people in a group being able to participate. It will be three months by the, by the time we actually get ready to go. Three months minimum, it might be even a little bit more. For us to actually shut down again if we get a spike uh, and, and we get a spike in sports. So if we get that spike, for us to actually turn around and be able to start again, I think we're at the end of the year. And so, you know, from the season perspective i think we've all got to take that responsibility and thinking hey we we're, we're so we're so keen to be playing and getting back and being active then let's let's just take that little bit of caution uh and making sure we get everybody uh nice and safe thank you rob you did certainly preempt my next question because i love the phrase that i've heard you use in the media quite a few times that, that sport will only get one chance to to get it right yeah. and we need to play our role it's not just about gymnastics it's yeah. not just about the clubs on this webinar. It's about all sports, all codes, and we all need to to take that personal and collective responsibility to make sure that we uh, that we go about this in the right way. Yeah, exactly. Um, any final comments, Rob? Really, again, really, really appreciate your time. I know how busy you are. Any um, uh, you'd like to yeah. add? Yeah, I, I think um, you know. Again, other than reiterating a, a massive thank you to everybody. Uh, for what you've done and what you're about to do, um, it really is. You know, we become we become the front line, and I know you know our medicos and nurses and everybody have done such a terrific job across Australia. But you know, we're now next to the, the, the new front line, you know, to make this all work. But I would, you know, I know you're all the converted. Just 
in any time you get an opportunity to talk to anybody uh, about the sport, we really need our participants back. No matter how, how old they are, we've got to get them off the couch, we've got to get them off the mobile devices, and we've got to get them back, and we've got to get them participating again. And I'm sure everybody's seen the statistics. In Australia, we, we are ranked 194 out of 196 on the obesity index, the global obesity index. And there are only two countries behind us, and one we all know, and the other one's New Zealand. Uh, and so we've got some work to do, you know, and we, we, we want to get, all, all of you, we want you to have a full house. We want people getting back, you know, gymnastics, such an amazing sport. You know, we want, we want to get people back uh, participating in sport. So if you get the opportunity, don't, uh, every time I get a camera shoved in my face, that's what I'm talking about. The, the call to arms, you know, is to get people back and participating in our sports. And that's, that's, uh, that's probably about it, Kitty. Yep, no, that's a great note to finish on, Rob. Um, thank you. I, I did mention just for everybody on, on this webinar, Rob is, is acting CEO. Um, probably didn't think he would be hit with this uh, in, in an acting role, keeping the seat warm. So thank you, Rob, for everything that, that you're doing for, for sport in this country, because it, it is quite an incredible time. And, and thank you very much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. No, thank you very much. Thank and you. all the best. Thanks, Rob. Thanks. Um, Okay, so Stephen from Gymnastics Queensland, thank you very much for joining us today and a lot of Queensland clubs working hard to prepare to, to reopen up there and I know Stephen's been working very closely and, and GQ has been working very closely with those clubs to, to help them prepare. Um, so Stephen, what, what are you seeing in your liaison with clubs as the, I suppose, the top three barriers or, or challenges um, that clubs need to overcome prior to opening. Thanks, Kitty, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, so far, the top three barriers I would say that we've experienced through conversations with clubs is, firstly, Gymnastics Australia and Gymnastics Queensland will continue to provide guidance to our affiliated clubs. But it's essential that clubs take the time to consider all the risks that might prevent present excuse me, themselves within their own venues when they open again and ensure they've done everything they can to mitigate those risks. So that will include each club having their own COVID safe plan in place. And it's critical with that plan that each club's staff have been provided with the appropriate training on this and they have the knowledge to ensure that members abide by the measures that are within that plan. One of the other things following on from the training of staff is stakeholder education because that's going to be vitally important for our clubs. So clubs are going to need to communicate with their stakeholders to ensure that all parents and athletes and staff realise that it won't be things as normal, things will need to change, and that everybody connected with the club will play an important part in that. Um, how clubs communicate that to their membership will differ, but it is essential that it's done so, so that everyone's following the directives of the government. And one of the other ones which is interesting is, is that, of course, we're all eager to get back into the clubs and get everything reopened as soon as possible. But some clubs need to consider the viability of doing this. So for stage two in Queensland, we are set to open again from around midnight um, of uh, June 13th. And for some clubs, the limitations that are in place may not work for the classes that they usually have they may not have been able to engage the number of staff or the appropriate staff they need for this, and it may also not be financially viable for them. So perhaps stage three will be the more suitable time to continue with classes. And Stephen, how would you, that's a very good point actually. I think everyone's you know, excited saying, okay, Saturday, great, we can open. But to actually, and I'm sure you've worked with some clubs in this space, what, what's the actual process that, that a club should go through to determine is it actually right for me on Saturday to open? Well, we will always put that back to the clubs to ask them what works for them and keep in mind that, although, as they say, we are eager to get back to classes as soon as possible, when we reach July, in Queensland at least, it does move from 20 people to 100 people. And at that time, rather than trying to rush things and it not working out well and ensuring that we do everything correctly during this time, kids consider whether or not that July start date works well instead. Um, as I say, it is the decision of each club to determine whether or not it works for them or not, but it is important also to keep in mind that 
we'd rather get it right first time than potentially make mistakes along the way. Yep, absolutely. And I think that's the role that, that I know you're playing definitely in Queensland and all the state and territories associations can play to have that um, that direct liaison with clubs. And I don't know if you can just, just um, briefly talk about some of the initiatives that GQ is doing to, to ensure that your clubs can operate safely when they do reopen. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that we've done is we've put together a return to gymnastics guidelines that will be submitted to government but also provided to all of our clubs. Now the document that goes out to clubs will have a lot more gymnastics specific information and the information will be more extensive. But the idea is that clubs can use this as the foundation for building their own COVID safe plans that they'll need in place that they can share with their stakeholders or at least have available upon request. Um, Again, every club will have different ways of communicating this to their stakeholders. We've actually heard some clubs who are planning to have information evenings, not dissimilar to this as Zoom meeting, um, where they go over some of the measures that will be in place for their parents and for members. One of the other thing that we have been speaking to a number of clubs about is reporting and how that will change moving forward. So no longer will coming to a class just include ticking off that child on a register it's what reporting will need in place. And our cleaning reporting, for example, will be more extensive, but more so for those showing up to the gym. When members arrive, it's who will be meeting them, where will they be met, what information is required. Will the club, for example, have any of that information already down, ready for the coach, so that it can be checked to save a little bit of time? Because of course, these new processes will be time consuming. Um, ensure that staff know what the reporting procedure is, and most importantly, what information is required should, in the unfortunate case, there be an incident that therefore needs to be reported to the health authorities, to other members, and to us Gymnastics Queensland. The only other thing I would touch on is some of the actual practical measures that we put in place from clubs that have come through conversations with clubs from other sports, from ourselves. Um, and some of these include is that for stage two, June 13th, when clubs do open their doors again, it's how do we adapt the activities to ensure that they are non-contact. And you can get a little bit creative with this, but it's looking at present of how and what classes are delivered, where as we say, there's no physical contact within them until at least stage three. There's also another, um, a considerable amount of other measures, which includes the get in, train, get out, where yep. parents are dropping off their athletes, if they're able to enter through one door and exit through another, so that there's not large groups congregating between the transition of classes, around hand sanitization, labeling things, keeping items separate so that they're not overlapping one another, coaches not moving between groups. A lot of the the things that we've discussed recently in previous webinars with some of the presenters that have been present. Yep. That's fantastic, Stephen. Thank you so much. Some really useful tips in there. Um, and a lot of them replicating what Rob was talking about. I think that that entry exit one is a really good one. I know at my coffee shop in the morning, they, they try very hard, but they just fail abysmally on that because you just squeeze in, walk in and out of the tour. So a simple thing, but little tips like that um, are really good for everyone to hear. So Stephen, thank you for everything you're doing. And um, thank you very much for joining us on the webinar today. Thank you. And last but not least, Megan from Gungarlan um, Gymnastics Club in the ACT. Um, opening a whole new meeting for you as of about this time yesterday when, uh, when ACT clubs were told that they could basically reopen on, um, on Saturday. So I know in the ACT, Megan, one of the requirements is to have, and I think Stephen alluded to it earlier, is a return to play in a COVID safe environment plan. Um, can you talk through a, a bit about that plan? And now you've got 72 hours, how do you pull all that together so that you can reopen? Yeah, absolutely. So probably echoing your comments earlier, Kitty, about cautious and considered, we're not actually going to open our gym this Saturday. Um, we still have a fair bit of work to do for us to be comfortable in not only the implementation of our plan, but also the training of our staff to ensure we can do this really, really well. Yep. 
Um, but key features of our plan, um, probably first and foremost, is it's gone out to all of our members yesterday um, in a big club newsletter. Um, and what it highlights is that it's now a part of the terms and conditions of your enrolment with us. Um, and we will be implementing this plan and you need to comply with this plan um, so that we have the ability to, if someone is not complying, that we, we can take that, that extra step to potentially remove them for the safety of everyone else. Um, so that's, that's um, probably a, a, a more, um, I guess, draconian approach, but um, I feel like that's where we need to be um, in this environment um, and echoing what, what Rob said as well, that this is our one shot and we've got to get it right. Um, other key things that we've included in it are obviously reference to the multitude of information that we've had available to us through um, Gymnastics Australia, through the sport. Australia um, Return to Sport Toolkit, um, obviously from the ACT government, and then also um, there's a lot of information um, in, on the employee part for um, returning to the safe environment as well. Um, so we've referenced all that and, and sort of made it really clear where we can get information from to really support why we've made decisions about how we're going to operate. We've really structured our plan to, to sort of um, set out what your role and responsibility is as a member and coming into the club and then what we as a club are going to do to um, try and provide the most safe environment for you to return. So covered in that is um, what we'll do on hygiene, social distancing in the, in the gym, um, our cleaning protocols. Um, we've got, we're going to implement a new colour coding process for the arrival and departure of kids where we will be separating them and they'll be staying in their colour, not only in the waiting room, but also in the gym um, to enable us to have that separation um, on the floor and in those sort of common areas where they would likely come together. Um, things about um, chalk use, um, contact tracing, and also our, we've never done makeup classes as, as our club, and we've actually relaxed that for the first time ever. Um, so just our policy around how we're going to manage this because we want to keep people engaged. Um, it also um, touches on, um, you know, why we're doing this and, and what our approach is as a club. And that sort of comes back to what our values are as a club, which is fun being number one. Um, so it, it really kind of tries to bring together that community that we have in our club and that commitment that we want people to make to this is your club and you have to be responsible um, coming back into this environment. Um, we've also created as part of that, obviously that is a, that's a six page document that's very wordy. Um, we also um, have a supporting document, which is a one page poster for the kids that explains this is the responsibility for you guys. And it talks in kid friendly language. It has little cartoon pictures as well so that they understand, you know, when I come back to gym, I'm not allowed to touch my friend. I'm not going to high five my coach and that kind of stuff. So um, that went out as well. And we've um, in part of our comms with our, our members was to say, you know, sit down with your, your child, go through the, the little poster and explain what each thing means so that when you come into class, you're really clear on, on how it needs to work. Wow, that's fantastic. Megan, I had about 10 questions here for you, but you've answered them all in that one response. Um, I saw a lot of people scribbling down. There were some fantastic things in there. I, I particularly like what you said at the end and it linked into what to what um, Stephen was saying as well about assessing the viability of reopening and linking that back to your values is, is a really important thing. And to make sure that ultimately for all of us, you know, the fun and enjoyment and safety of the kids in our gyms is primary important. So Absolutely. To, to really make sure that that's at the heart of decisions and we don't all reopen just because we can and suddenly have all these draconian rules and regulations on kids and they're gonna, they're gonna say, hey, but I think the colour coding is great. I'm sure a lot of people would wanna colour code kids all the time and say, no, you can only go there or you can go there. But um, really, really good tips in there, Megan. Thank you very much. And, um, and good luck with your process in the next, the next couple of days or weeks uh, leading into a, a safe and values driven, child friendly reopening. Really great messages. Thank you very much. No worries. Um, so that's a half hour. Boy, it went quickly today, didn't it? Um, there was some fantastic information from, I, I can't possibly synthesize it all in, in a quick wrap, wrap up, but I think some of the key points that were, were common themes between Rob, Stephen and, uh, and Megan, 
the importance of education and communication to staff and also to members prior to reopening. That reiteration, and we've been going on about this for a while, about personal responsibility, and we can't, you know, you, you can only be responsible for what happens in your four walls, but that education and communication about how people enter your venue uh, is also very important. The role of the, the safety officer, and I've seen a, a few chats and questions about this, there are some, there is information about that safety officer role in, uh, in the Return to Sport Toolkit. So I encourage you all to have a look at that, but to really consider having someone in your club who is that go-to for all things uh, COVID safety. Assessing the viability, um, the entry and exit points, and that, uh, that cautious approach, I think are some key messages that's come out today. And just to finish with, I'd like, I really like what, um, what Rob said, is that sport is the new front line of recovery. And I think that's a really, really good analogy. Sport will absolutely be called on. We're so much a part of the fabric of, of communities, especially our gymnastics clubs. We want to get back to that. As Rob said, we want to get those kids and those members back through our doors. So we stay as one of the top three participation sports in Australia, which, which we still are according to the latest Oz Play data. And I really like that, that, that we are now at the front line of that recovery, recovery of our communities. And that's that's an honour, but it's also a responsibility that we do get it right. So I wish you all very much um, the best of luck and planning, uh, wading through that, uh, not wading through, I shouldn't say that, reading through the Return to Sport Toolkit. Uh, it is practical and useful resources that I really would encourage you to have a look at as you go through the process of assessing the viability of your reopening timing based, of course, on your state and territory regulations. Thank you very much for joining us today. I think it was a, a really useful session. Um, thank you again to Rob, Stephen and Megan, and thanks to everyone for joining us. Have a great week and see you next week. Bye.